Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be continuing our Victoria 3 tutorial series and we're going to be talking about how to start a game in Victoria 3. We're going to be primarily focused on three different sections of this sort of thing. First is evaluating countries based on kind of the opening menu of when you start a game uh, because you're presented with rather limited information before you get in the game. Second, we'll be talking about how to evaluate countries once you're already inside the game. And then third, we're going to be talking about sort of a basic checklist of things you do when you start a game before you unpause this sort of thing. And finally, at the very end, I will be recommending some countries that I think are pretty good for beginners based on a certain play style you might want to be playing or might be interested in. So let's jump in. So first up, we're going to talk about all the information you have available to you at the start um, when you are starting a game. Before you get into game, um, this is kind of abstracted information. It's not necessarily going to guide and give you too much, but we're going to talk through it and talk about it a little bit. The first, we're going to talk about the army ones, uh, both the flotillas and the uh, land army. Now, you can, of course, build more military fairly easy. You can build more ships fairly easy. Uh, but overall, let's talk about it. So flotillas will take a, quite a while to construct. Um, there are several mechanics in the game that you can abuse to kind of circumvent the need for having a really large navy. And if you're using these, uh, the number of ships you have don't really matter. If you have like 10 uh, plus, it's going to be, you're going to be fine. Um, whatever you're doing. But if you're just kind of cruising through the game and you're not wanting to abuse mechanics, having 20 navy um, will be uh, important for being able to, you know, subjugate kind of the smaller countries, um, which is kind of generally a better strategy to go over after unrecognized countries. And having, you know, 40 plus is going to let you kind of place ball uh, kind of in relatively large wars against a variety of great powers and this sort of thing. Um, but overall, not a very important metric for evaluating a starting country. Next up, we have number of battalions, which is actually terrible for evaluating countries because it doesn't take into account the type of equipment you're using. France actually has the strongest military at the start of the game. And uh, a better indicator of how strong your army is at the start of the game is going to be army power projection. This gives you a pretty good idea with one exception. And so when we take a look at France, they have a power projection of 1550. And then if we take a look at the person with the absolute most battalions of China, they only have a power projection of 445, uh, so France can very easily defeat China. Uh, and China can't get really onto new equipment very quickly, but once they do, obviously they have way more battalions. The exception to the rule is going to be the United States, which has a power projection of 88, because they don't have a large regular army, but they have a lot of conscripts, and this is kind of their advantage. They actually have quite a strong military, uh, but you can't really calculate it or view it, uh, you know, through the starting lens here. Um, okay. So next up we have GDP, which is kind of a bit to talk through because GDP will be inflated by your population. Uh, whatever your population is, uh, if you have a ton of peasants, they will work in subsistence farms and these will contribute to the GDP, but not very efficiently. And so you will have some countries like China that has an enormous GDP, but it's all coming from subsistence farms and they can't tax their pops very well with the, kind of their starting situation. So China is not very strong despite having a GDP of 150 million. GDP is still a really good indicator of how strong you are at the start of the game, but if we take a look at someone like Great Britain, they'll have roughly 1.5x uh, GDP to population ratio. They have a ton of industry, they got a ton of stuff going on, and so this is a really strong indicator that Great Britain is extremely strong at the start of the game, you know, possibly even stronger than France, although str France has a stronger military. Great Britain, you could just build up the military because you can support it with both your GDP and something that is not visible at the start is... Great Britain has a ton of subjects, which isn't kind of visible through this lens here, uh, but will greatly contribute, you know, to their military power and to their ability to uh, support stuff. Okay, let's talk about population. So if GDP is a sort of indicator of how strong you are at the start, population is a really good indicator of how much you can grow, because as long as you have access to a lot of cheap labor, you can keep having a comparative advantage against the rest of the world, and you can have really efficient businesses, because all of your profits of all your buildings are going to be, you know, their inputs minus their outputs. Wait, sorry, their outputs minus their inputs important. Labor is a one of the major inputs, right? And so if you keep the labor cheap, which you can do if you have a really large population, then you have a ton of room to grow. And so you can think of population as your ability to grow. Next up, we can think of arable land. And a good way to think of arable land, roughly speaking, uh, building a ton of farms is not very strong in this game. It's better to focus on industrialization. So you don't want the arable land as much um, 
it's not necessarily a super good indicator of kind of how much potential you have um, with your buildings because by the time you want to build a lot of farms you could have conquered territory but what it is a good indicator of is how much population you're starting um, Ops or your starting land can support and so for example china can support a ton of population and there's kind of two exceptions to um this sort of rule um there's a bunch of rice subsistence farms here in kind of this asia e area uh these can support way more population than the arable land seems to indicate so for example japan is going to have roughly half the arable land that they can that it looks like that they could use to support this population. What I mean is like, if it were to be Russia, they would have uh, twice the amount of arable land to support like a similar looking population as Japan, because Japan has all these rice farms. Um, you see, uh, Russia has roughly twice the population, but they have four times the arable land of uh, the Japan, because Japan has all rice farms. So rice farms are kind of, uh, it's preferable not to have rice arable land for a variety of reasons um, but this is kind of the first exception here the second exception is going to be all of the new world is going to have way more arable land than they have relative to population you see uh the united states of america has a 4.4k arable land and that's more than russia but the United States has a fourth of their population. So what this is going to mean for everyone in the New World is you're going to attract a ton of migrants as a result of the arable land. And so arable land is going to be a strong, which is going to effectively mean their population's higher. So even though the United States only has 15 mil pop, they still have a ton more potential for cheap labor because they have all this arable land, which through the in-game mechanics are is going to drive migration. So you want to also look at arable land, especially in the New World, as an indicator of how much you can grow. Um, next up we have is literacy, which is going to be extremely important uh, for determining kind of two things. There's two things going on in literacy. Uh, your starting tech is going to be determined by your literacy, roughly speaking. The UK has the best tech and they start out with 53% literacy. Generally speaking, most of the high literacy countries are going to be here in Western Europe, with Austria kind of being a little step below, but most of the 40 percenters over here. Um, even the small powers tend to be like around 40%. And so it's going to be an indicator of how much what your starting tech looks like. But also uh, with how innovation works, uh, especially if you're are a small GDP country and you can't really afford to invest in universities, literacy is going to be a pretty strong indicator of you know, how much technology you're going to be getting because of the way technology spreads works. And so being a low literacy country will hurt quite a bit. And uh, for example, if we take a look at the lowest literacy here in Victoria, uh, they're gonna have like literacy of six. They start with like almost no tech and catching up will be very, very, very difficult. Um, and so this is what literacy is about. Uh, standard living is not especially important at the start of the game. It's actually relatively tight uh, in terms of uh, where everyone is. Uh, it's slightly a bit in the, of an indicator of how much industry you have. You notice uh, Great Britain will have a relatively high standard of living and someone like Xing will have kind of a low standard of living, but it's not the necessarily the best indicator. Okay. Your cultures will determine like what types of lands, your culture and your religion will determine what types of lands and peoples you can integrate easily. Uh, if they're similar to yours, you can integrate them more easily, but this is not an especially important thing to keep in mind, nor is government. Now, let's talk about the actual most important thing. And that is, if anything is, we'll take a look. Ottomans are a major power. Uh, if unrecognized is before your country, this is going to make a huge difference in your gameplay and is perhaps one of the strongest things you can take a look at. If we take a look at Egypt, for example, they're an unrecognized major power. So even though Egypt has, you know, a relatively high population, a pretty good GDP, you know, uh, the literacy is not the best, but uh, they also have a really strong power projection at the start of the game of 700. Um, Egypt is going to be kind of a lot harder start than someone who looks otherwise relatively, well, actually their GDP is way bigger, but the Ottomans look somewhat similar, but they're going to be a lot easier start because they're a major power. And so um, let's jump into kind of the wiki so we can talk about specifically all the modifiers that are going to be a lot different uh, for when you are recognized or when you are not. So let's jump in. 
and get into it. So you see here, uh, there's gonna be a stratification here where we have major power and unrecognized major power. And the thing we're really focused on is unrecognized. Uh, if you are recognized, you can kind of, or even if you're unrecognized, you can move up the ladder as you gain power. And so whether you start as a major power or great power is not such a big deal because you can move from major power to great power, but it is hard without abusing some mechanics to move from unrecognized to recognized. Um, there's ways you can kind of abuse this, but without getting into those, uh, if you play kind of normal, you will have to declare war on a great power in order to become a recognized power. So you have to become really strong if you start out unrecognized and you will suffer a ton of malices. So first of all, uh, your interest rate uh, your interest rate is going to be really low uh, if you are a great power, and it's going to be really high if you're unrecognized, especially if you're unrecognized and small. It's going to be particularly um, difficult. This is why, generally speaking, if you're unrecognized, you do not want a deficit spend in the game, and so this will kind of lock the really fast growth you can get from deficit spending if you're a GP or even a major power, um, and so you can't don't want to go this way. Additionally, tech spread is going to be one of the ways you gain a lot of tech, especially if you have to build over on universities above kind of above your cap, or if you uh, don't have a very large economy at the start of the game and you can't afford universities, tech spread is going to be the biggest driver of how much technology you get, and you suffer malice if you are unrecognized, and it is bigger if you are a smaller unrecognized power, but you still suffer a malice, and so this is, means it's going to be harder to gain a lot of tech. You also incur a lot more infamy when you are conquering people if you are uh, unrecognized, although you will also suffer more infamy the larger you are. So for example, unrecognized major power pays the most extra infamy for expansion, and generally speaking you kind of want to keep the infamy a little bit low, preferably unless you're doing a high infamy run, but this is a different thing to talk about. And so this is a pretty big penalty because it will slow your expansion rate um, that you can do kind of comfortably without having to deal with a lot of people getting mad at you. Um, so this is going to be a big one. Infamy for attackers, this is just kind of a, something to keep in mind uh, if you are taking uh, stuff from unrecognized powers you have to pay less infamy for it so just a neat little tidbit diplo pact cost not especially important but migration attraction is quite important um, if you are unrecognized and you are small you will suffer migration attraction malices which is uh, particularly uncomfortable, especially if you're joining someone's customs union, which can often be a really good strategy. Um, it can be a little bit bad for you as far as the migration goes, uh, because you're going to be struggling um, to gain pops. Remember, pops are kind of an indication of how much you can grow, so the migration attraction malice kind of stunts your growth a little bit, although a lot of the more playable recognized countries will be uh, have a lot of pop. And so just jumping back into it real quick, I think an example like uh, Japan looks like they might be extremely strong at the start of the game. You know, their GDP is not the tremendously large, but they have a decent population. You could kind of like compare them maybe to an Austria, you know, similar population. GDP is a little bit lower and maybe we can grow. Okay, we don't have good PMs at the start, this sort of stuff, but Japan will actually be a much weaker start than Austria. A large part of that being the fact that they're unrecognized and also they start off with worse tech. And so this might be the most important kind of um, thing you pay attention to. If you want your run to be more challenging, you want to have this unrecognized in front or if you want to be behind on uh, like tech and this type of stuff, you know, to have a, you know, a more challenging start. Um, but if you don't want to be like have a more challenging start, you know, there's a big difference pre between playing something like Tunis and playing something, you know, like Tuscany, even though it doesn't necessarily look like there's a huge difference because Tuscany is insignificant, but they're recognized and Tunis is unrecognized. And so this is going to mean until you get, you know, great power, absolutely huge status, you're going to be suffering all the penalties from being unrecognized from Tunis until you can declare a war for recognition. So these are kind of the important ones for evaluating when you are going to be going through. Just real quick, uh, you can think of, for military, you wanna pay attention to your army power projection with the exception of the US. Uh, for Navy, 20 is a pretty good number to have that kind of lets you do what you want uh, with the smaller powers and 40 is kind of good for being able to do stuff against great powers or larger powers, this sort of stuff. Maybe not the UK because they have a large uh, Navy. GDP is a pretty good indicator of how strong you are at the start. Uh, of course, you if you have a really large population, you have to keep in mind your population is is going to inflate your GDP. Population is a very strong indicator of how much you can grow. Arable land is a strong indicator of, uh, you know, how many pops you can attract uh, with two kind of things to note, which is that uh, they will have less arable land uh, than it looks like in terms of 
they will be able to support more pops than it looks like in terms of terms of arable land in all the places that have rice subsistence farms which is kind of this area here and secondly in the new world they will have way more arable land um relative to their population and they can support a lot more pops so when you are looking at the united states you could kind of assume that they're going to have more pops uh, literacy is a good indicator of how much tech you have at the start, and this is kind of, you know, how you interpret all this information. The other stuff, not so important. So let's jump on to the next thing. So next up, we're going to talk about sort of four things that you can look at in-game at a glance very quickly when you start a game that will give you a good idea of how your country is going to play or some challenges you might face, and this sort of thing. First up is going to be how much pops you accept or do not accept. So we'll come into the cultures tab. You do not want to sort by political strength. This is not how many pops you have. You want to sort by population here. And you will see that we have, if we look over here, the star means they're accepted. The boot means, well, you get the idea they're not accepted. Um, this is going to be based on what laws you have, uh, but generally speaking, getting to the cultural acceptance laws is a bit difficult with multiculturalism and so you'll see here we have a French, Occitanian, Breton. These are huge chunks of our population. Almost all of our population is accepted. If you're playing as a beginner you generally want to start as a country that has a pretty high acceptance rate because you're going to run into problems with both radicals and qualifications if you don't have a lot of accepted pops. Uh, a good example of a uh, country that has an enormous amount of discrimination is the Dutch East Indies, uh, where if we take a look at the culture tab, almost all of their pops are discriminated against. If we sort by here, uh, we're sorting by pop. We have 8 million Javans that we discriminate against, only 30k Dutch that we do not. And so we will have problems with qualifications, with radicals, with a lot of stuff here. And so again, would not recommend starting on a uh, high discrimination country. The second thing we want to look at is economy balance and what I mean by balance is we want to take a look at the buildings and we want to take a look at the rural stuff uh, you will see both farms and plantations rice farms and then all these that are plantations and then you want to rate or kind of look at relative uh, to your industry and your mining and your logging camps what does it look like and you will see here in the Dutch East Indies we are overwhelmingly farming oriented. Generally speaking, you want to kind of be industrial oriented in uh, Victoria 3. So even if we have a decent sized you know, economy or GDP, uh, it's kind of focused in the sorts of uh, industries that we are preferred not to have. You know, we only have the logging camps as far as industrial stuff goes. And so we, again, will be a struggle, you know, relative to all the other features that you have all, or all the other metrics you have available. If we switch countries, let's say to UK here, we will see that most of their stuff is going to be focused industrially and so they will have a leg up and this is because the capitalists as a class are better than the landowners and so you see they do have well, quite a few farms and livestock ranches and also a smattering of plantations but they have an enormous amount of logging camps fishing wharves which you count as industrial whaling stations they have a ton of mines and they have an enormous amount of all of this where the dutch east indies didn't have any of it and so this is an important metric uh, for looking at it because it's not just the gdp it's also what the GDP is coming from. Um, in the case of the Dutch East Indies, it's primarily farming. It's almost overwhelmingly farming. All right, next up, you want to also look at your laws. In particular, there's four law categories that are going to be... Uh, kind of a good indication of how the game might play out early or they're going to be particularly bad although they are easy to change using the corn laws journal entry which um, we have here uh, these can be easy to change some of them but not all of them so let's jump in uh, in particular slavery is bad uh, also uh, serfdom is bad and also uh, traditionalism is particularly bad um, and so serfdom is bad because it doesn't let you swap to the better eco economic systems and then these economic systems are bad because they don't give you a lot of investment pool it's a bit too much to unpack in this video but just know that you do not want to have traditionalism you do not want to have serfdom and you do not want to have uh, mercantilism or mercantilism and you really don't want isolationism so Earlier we talked about Japan. Japan starts out with isolationism and they start out with some pretty bad laws. Let's click on them, if we can click correctly. So we're gonna come in. Japan starts out with kind of all the worst ones except they do have slavery banned, but they have serfdom, uh, they have traditionalism, and they have isolationism, which means you can do no trading. An isolationist start, if you are not going to use uh, 
the abuse the kind of way you can use a great power to open your market by declaring war on them and then just backing down. Um, if you're not going to do this, it is going to make your start a lot more different because Japan could do no trade at the start. And so the laws are particularly important. And finally, another really important one to look at is your resource potentials. Um, in particular, we're going to come into those resource tabs. You kind of want to have a little bit of everything when it comes to coal, iron, lead, sulfur. Uh, when it comes to these four, you want to have a little bit of each one um, because this will kind of just smooth out your run overall. You can support all of your stuff domestically. In particular, you want to have a lot of iron and logging at the start of the game. And so Japan is a pretty good start because it has all four of these, um, but it doesn't really have an enormous amount of logging available. Uh, it has a solid amount. Japan is solid in resources, and it does have a solid amount of iron mines available, but these are going to be really important resources, and other ones you can lab nab later. If we switch countries and go to Russia, one of Russia's biggest... Uh, Russia has an enormous amount of advantages, and one of the biggest ones is they have really good resource potentials at the start of the game. You'll see they have an enormous amount of iron mines. They particularly have iron mines with big bonuses, and you're all in perm, for example. You know, 96, 75, just huge numbers. Uh, 45, all this, and they have a lot, a lot, a lot of logging potentials. And so these are important to look at because these you do not get an indicator of in the previous menu when you are starting a game. You only get an indicator of the agriculture. Now as far as the agriculture goes, um, there are some goods that are better than others, so let's switch to Great Xing to take a look. Uh, Great Xing notably starts out with a unique bonus for agriculture, but it is nice to have... Oop, it is not essential, but it is nice to have in your agricultural potentials access to dye. A little bit of access to cotton is kind of okay, but it's, it's very nice to have access to dye and silk plantations. And opium is actually particularly good. So there's going to be kind of a smattering of countries here that have access to opium, which is a significant advantage. Um, it is nice to have also having access to silk and dyes. Uh, domestically is pretty nice, although... A lot of these countries that have access to both dyes and silks are going to have rice farms, which is not preferable. And so these are the both pop acceptance, economy balance, laws, and resource potentials are kind of the four things you can just take a quick look at, uh, you know, in game. And we can, for example, let's find, let's find a country that has not so good resources. So if we take a look at New Granada, for example, and their resources, they do not have lead and sulfur. And while they do have access to some logging mines that have, or logging mines, logging camps that have uh, bonuses, um, they do not have a ton of iron, just this one level 36, although the iron is pretty nice to have. So they kind of have a medium start um, as far as the resources go. Uh, but you could easily find someone with a similar GDP and population that would have a better resource start. But fundamentally, this isn't necessarily the most important. The most important thing kind of to look at this section is probably do you have a lot of pops that you discriminate against? And if we sort here, we see that... Eh, the, they're doing relatively okay. They do have a lot of discriminated pops. This is kind of common for all the South American countries, but they have a lot of pops that are not discriminated against. Actually, kind of all the Americas. Um, but they have a lot of pops that do they don't discriminate against, and they have okay resources. Um, but yeah, you want to check these things uh, when you are starting a game before you kind of get into the action. Um, just keeping in mind that if you don't have access to resources, you have discriminated pops, these will present additional challenges in the game. Finally, when you are ready to start a game, you've decided upon the country you want to play, there's kind of five things you want to do before you want to pause, and one of them is a little bit philosophical. We'll talk about that one first. You can, roughly speaking, in Victoria 3, think of construction as your GDP growth rate. So generally speaking, if you don't know what to do, increasing construction is a good idea. And the first thing you want to do in any game of Victoria 3 is uh, sort of decide what you're going to build. Usually it's going to be more construction centers, but if we take a look at our construction centers, we'll see all the goods that go into the buildings for our construction centers and so generally it will often be good to build these with the exception of fabric you'll usually want to import that build these yourself and build more construction and kind of have a little bit of a loop and so if we're coming here we maybe want to build them tall in Paris because we're deciding we're going to build in Paris let's put down five and now our construction queue is filled and then maybe we want to build some logging camps somewhere and then some iron mines somewhere something like this because these go into uh, 
building more construction. So that's the first thing is you want to get your construction queue. You want to make sure that you're using all of it, whatever it is. And you often, when in doubt, want to increase it as long as it looks like you can afford it. Second of all, you want to spend all of your authority. And this is probably the biggest one you are going to use. You see that we are already spending some of it if we hover the tooltip. So let's refund the suppressing the intelligentsia, which we don't want to do anyways, and also collecting the consumption tax, and then talk about what all you can spend your authority on, because this is going to be, you know, kind of uh, a pretty big list. So we'll stop suppressing them, of course. And we'll see, we have a nice big pile of authority, and there's going to be several things to spend it on. So the first of all, you can suppress or bolster an interest group. Um, often, I think that the uh, industrialist is a decent one to bolster if they are not already powerful. Um, and so getting them to that level uh, so that you can double their bonus is particularly good. But for the most part, um, bolstering and suppressing I don't think is especially good. Uh, you can also spend them on consumption taxes, which will often be a lot better the bigger your GDP is relative to your population at the start of the game so for france we can actually squeeze a lot of money out of um you know our consumption taxes and so this would probably be where we want to spend a lot of our authority um let's just we're just going to pick some sin taxes and services are generally and luxuries are generally the way to go you don't want to want to tax grain and we have a little bit extra authority and uh we'll come in and the last thing you can kind of spend your authority on that's a good investment of authority is going to be decrees uh, in particular, these decrees go down on individual states, and they will be a lot more valuable uh, depending on uh, how many states you have, because obviously if you have one state, it affects your entire country, and if you have a ton of states, it doesn't affect as much, and so this will be kind of how you evaluate whether or not to put them in. Um, I think building tall in one particular state and using encouraged manufacturing is often a good strategy, and I think that also encouraging resource industries, since building resource industries early on is particularly good, is a nice another nice one so we could let's say go in alsace lorraine we we're getting a coal mining throughput bonus here and we also have a high level iron mine so we might want to encourage uh resource industries there and then uh build the manufacturing in the capital here in isle de france and this is just spending your authority you want to make sure you spend it all before you want pause you can decide how you want to spend it you notice we were losing 7k before um with our level of construction and now we're making money uh, kind of an additional one, I know I said five, but I guess I really mean six. You, as part of your authority slash balancing the budget, you will often want to have high military wages. Um, you don't need high military wages if you're not fighting a difficult war, but if you're fighting a difficult war, it will give you pretty powerful bonuses for what you're investing. Um, and you will also want to generally raise taxes if you have a lot of peasants. And then as you run out of peasants and you get to later taxation laws, you'll want to lower taxes, but this is just kind of very brief overview. And so this is, you might want to raise taxes at the very opener of the game in order to build more construction because again, construction is your GDP growth rate. Um, next up, we want to also spend a lot of our influence. And so we will just come into the diplomacy tab and we will look to uh, improve relations with anyone who we want to have a particular, uh, you know, good relation with. Almost everyone will benefit from improving relations with Great Britain because Great Britain has interests almost everywhere in the world and uh, you want to anytime you declare war you get a negative relations with them and you don't want them fighting you you also want to generally declare uh improve relations with anyone who you are kind of afraid of at the start so you know if you are in india and you are not the east india company so let's say you're playing as the sikh empire improving relations with the east india company so that they don't declare war on you is a good idea if a country has a positive relation of you um if we see here we're neutral if it's positive they can't declare war on you directly they have to join in a play against you and so you will want to spend probably spend all of your um you know, relations will just kind of improve with some random GPs. Uh, the exception to this is if you want to bankroll someone or you want to spend your influence like other ways other than improving relations, but improving relations is generally what you do at the start, although you can get infamy decay. Uh, speaking of infamy, you also want to declare a war at the very start uh, because your infamy is constantly decaying and you start out with no infamy and if you're not using your infamy decay you're losing it so you almost always want to declare war at the very beginning we're going to declare one at brunei well we're not going to declare one on brunei because we aren't adjacent uh, but we'll pull a france and we'll dominion algeria at the very start something like this and now we have some infamy and so we will be constantly decaying that infamy and so we're not letting our infamy decay as a resource go to waste um, 
And this is perhaps a little advanced. If you just want to unpause and play and not declare war, you don't necessarily have to, but if you're trying to play tight, um, this is going to be important. Or declaring an interest and then declaring a war. This is another thing. Let's come into it. Often you will have not all of your interest declared at the start, and so you can put one. So let's say we wanted to start a war in Brunei instead of Algeria. We could have but declared an interest here. This is kind of an extension of diplomacy. Um, you can only start diplomatic plays in areas where you have an interest, so it's important to declare kind of where you want to be, you know, fooling about. And then... We, there's one last thing you want to do before you start. You want to start passing laws that are kind of consistent with where you want to be going as long as, you know, there's kind of a good law pass to go. So, for example, we might want colonial exploitation instead. And so we now we pass a law. And so just to kind of quickly go through it, uh, you want to improve relations uh, with the people who you are trying to get closer to. Obviously, you want to declare diplomatic interests. You want to make sure your construction queue is building something. Generally, at the start of the game, it's probably going to be more construction and construction materials um you want to start passing a law uh you want to declare war to make use of your infamy decay and finally you also want to spend all of your authority and this is probably the most important one the benefit you get from floating excess authority is not particularly large and so this kind of just gives you an idea of what you want to do before you unpause and then philosophically speaking if you're not sure what to do just increasing construction and keeping that construction queue going is a good way of thinking about the game or thinking about what you should be doing it's really gdp growth rate you don't want to leave it at a low level Level, and I hope that this has been informative. Finally, some country recommendations. So for the beginner, I would recommend starting as any great power, uh, first of all, but often, you know, you don't want to necessarily start as a great power, you want some room to go grow. If you are going to start as a great power, I particularly would recommend Russia because you, there's a lot you can do in terms of passing laws and also catching up on technology. You will start behind in technology quite a bit, but they start out with some of the regressive laws and so some of the more fun play patterns are passing a lot of laws and trying to figure out how to do it. And Russia also has a lot of resources they're very resource rich they're very population rich and so they have a ton of room for growth and so you know you will see the line go up they have a lot of potential in this regard and so russia in particular i think is the probably best gp to start out as for beginners but let's talk about um you know kind of the other ones so prussia and austria will kind of be pitted against each other throughout the game and prussia in particular you can learn about customs union mechanics because pulling people into your customs union uh, is a way to grow and form the north german Federation. Uh, and so Prussia is going to be, you know, nice on that mechanic, as well as also having some place where they can rumble um, at the start of the game. So if you kind of want to fight, you want to develop the wars, and you want to have kind of uh, uh, a bit of flavor, uh, this is good. If you want a slightly weakened version of uh, what Prussia looks like, by the way, Austria kind of plays similarly as Prussia, uh, but is a little bit stronger, at least on this patch. Um, uh, if you want a weaker version of this uh, idea, you can play as two Sicilies while not being a GP. They're kind of a GP because they can very easily form Italy, which is going to be very strong. And you kind of have a structured path of going after these guys who are going to be, you know, relatively easy to go after. It's not like a hard war. And so just exploring the war mechanics, it's going to be good. Uh, both France and uh, Great Britain will feel like a bit of a sandbox. The United States, you have, you know, some local flavor as well as the ideas of colonizing and some wars to go after with men. Mexico, and so this is going to be good. Spain is going to be kind of like France or Great Britain, but substantially weaker. So if you kind of want that sandboxy feel, Spain can be pretty good. Um, if you want to be even weaker and just kind of mind your own business and look to just eco up, as well as maybe, you know, abuse some people in the Congo, you can play as Belgium. You notably start out with zero boats. And so if you kind of want to really mind your own business, um, Belgium is okay. If you don't start out with any flotillas, uh, you can't expand very easily. And the sort of stuff and so this is the mind your own business but have a ton of literacy and be recognized type of country uh in particular i think there are two uh well there's let's talk about the ottomans and i think there's two unrecognized powers that are particularly fun to play one of them is egypt the other is japan but we, in order to talk about egypt we have to also talk about the ottoman empire both of these guys are relatively fun starts um they have you know kind of 
opposed starts. They will have uh, event. They will likely fight each other, both Egypt and the Ottomans, especially if you're Egypt, because the Ottomans will declare on you. You have a, like a relatively robust military. Egypt will also have unique uh, kind of experience because you can colonize down south, and so you will have extra access into sub-Saharan Africa while still having quite a bit of a challenge because you'll be really far behind technologically because both your literacy rate starts low and you are unrecognized. So you'll have this aspect, you'll have, you know, kind of the colonization game, and you will have a warring kind of start if you want to play out the wars, although they can be a little bit unforgiving in regards to, you know, Ottomans versus Egypt. Um, the Ottomans are also going to be a fun start because, again, you're kind of railroaded into the start a little bit, or into the wars a little bit in regards to fighting Egypt. Um, they are a relatively weak uh, major power, uh, but they do have access to a pretty sizable population. Uh, they're a little bit behind on tech but okay and finally uh let's talk about uh one of the ones i really like quite a lot for beginners is the japan uh the japanese shogunate uh the reason why is okay you have a ton of room for growth but also they are actually isolationists so they cannot trade and this means you have to kind of look through all of like the production lines and what feeds into what and this sort of stuff and figure out kind of all the sorts of things that your buildings can build and what they need and this sort of stuff uh, in an environment where you're not really getting declared war on too much um, and you can also you'll be kind of wanting to start the colonization game a little bit you can colonize a little over here too um, overall it's a very fun start um, especially if you do not use the corn laws uh, or you know uh, other mechanics to kind of reform going through the process of reforming I think is a bit interesting and kind of gives you a good idea of the underlying mechanics of passing laws and this sort of stuff. And so I think it's a great country to learn on, um, a lot of fun. In particular, I would recommend not playing as Great Shing if you are a beginner, uh, because they only have access to rice farms and they have quite a lot of, uh, well, so does Japan, but Japan's a little bit different, uh, because Japan doesn't have, uh, quite as unmanageable a population size, and so often you will hit really high unemployment with Great Shing, and you'll encounter difficulties, you also will get clapped by, you know, the UK at the very start, which doesn't feel good if you don't know how to win, um, the Opium Wars, which is kind of a little bit difficult, and so I would not recommend and playing as Great Shing. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell. I mean, click the bell. Don't hit it. Uh, and have a good day. And a good run of Victoria 3, assuming you're starting one.